So I'm just waiting for the movie where artificial tongues go rogue and like <laughs> one of them decides it's going to go and replace everybody's whiskey with like rapid age whiskey because it's got the perfect profile and, and there's just insanity and chaos, you know. Uh, <laughs> This is episode 217 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny, and as usual, a little bit of news to go through. So Larceny from Heaven Hill has launched a new app. It's an augmented reality app called Unlock the Rick House. The app was inspired by the history of John E. Fitzgerald. He was a treasury agent back in the late 1800s and early 1900s and was one of the only people that was legally allowed to carry the keys to the barrel storage rickhouses. With a discerning palate for fine bourbon, John Fitzgerald often used his rickhouse keys to gain access to some of the finest bur bourbon barrels for himself. And those barrels from which he chose to help himself were often referred to as the Fitzgerald barrels around the distillery. The infamous act of larceny led to the Larceny brand and has now inspired the newest augmented reality app. So once downloaded, you can explore the rickhouses by tapping on each one to search for the prize winning Fitzgerald barrel. And from September 1st through the December 31st, each tap of the Rick House gains one entry into the grand prize of $10,000. Daily prizes will also be awarded and include everything from a mini barrel shot glass and larceny magnets, all the way up until a larceny guitar or an LED sign. So you can get Unlock the Rick House available now on the Apple Store and Google Play. On Tuesday this week, I had the pleasure of joining Four Roses Master Distiller Brent Elliott to a special media preview of the 2019 limited edition small batch. We were able to ask him anything and taste through all the individual lots that comprised of this batch. And here's some of the details. The 2019 limited edition small batch will have a breakdown of four different bourbon runs. There is an 11 year OESV that accounts for 27% of the blend, a 15 year OESV at 40% of the blend, a 15 year OESK with 25% and a 21 year OBSV at 8% of the blend. And we got to go through each one of these and kind of rate them all and kind of figure out how they all led into creating their own blend. And the 21 year OBSV had the best nose. It was super oaky, but the finish lacked some depth. And there was, and I know there's a lot of OESK lovers out there, but this one had a pretty strong bite to it. It honestly wasn't my favorite. However, the 15 year OESV was the real star of the show. This had depth and complexity and just kept going. It had all the right components into it. But come to find out, this is the same run of OESV that was sold at the gift shop this past year for Father's Day. So there's a few lucky people out there sitting on some really good bourbon right now. And the final proof of this will be 112.6 with around 13,440 bottles to be released in the US and around 3,000 to the rest of the world with an MSRP of $139.99. During this time with Brent, we also discussed the barrels and if we would ever see a single barrel limited edition ever again. Well, the unfortunate news is that he said it's likely to never happen again. With the explosive growth of bourbon, it's almost impossible to find a run of barrels that were all distilled at one time that would be able to satisfy this type of demand. Instead, these runs will be saved for future small batches for years to come. He said they have plenty of high age stock, so this is great to hear for enthusiasts like us. I hope you're out there enjoying these whiskey quickies that we're releasing. As we get into the fall, we're going to be bringing new reviews of all the newest releases, including next week's as we review the new Four Roses Small Batch Limited Edition. All right, now on to the podcast. On this roundtable, we talk about bourbon festival season as we just wrapped up one, but we're heading into bourbon and beyond right around the corner. And if you haven't yet, go get your tickets. We'd love to see you there. Drink some good bourbon and listen to some good tunes. But after that, we dive into the acquisition business. Was the $233 million deal for Pernod Ricard to acquire Castle Brands, which Jefferson's is a part of, was that a good deal? Well, we had a lot of folks that were commenting in our chat section and talking about the EPIDA, or the Earnings Before Interest Tax Depreciation and Amortization. It's a measure of a company's operating performance. 
One comment we received was from Craig Kessler. He's a chief investment officer as well as an executive bourbon steward. So he talked about Pernod selling wild turkey at 12 times its EBITDA, while Brown Foreman was selling at 10x. So Pernod got an above market value during the time of the value of other competitors out there in the market. As for Pernod's re-entry to the market, Castle was trading at a price sales ratio of 1x and Pernod paid about 2x of the company. So Brown Foreman is currently trading at 8x. So Pernod is paying 75% less than Brown Foreman on a price per sale basis. So from this perspective, it looks like Pernod sold above market for Wild Turkey and bought Castle below. So we'll see about more of that into the podcast. But after that, we also dive into PBR's new whiskey, the artificial tongue, and if EU tariff data that's now been published is still going to continue to wreak havoc on new exports. All right, now let's get on to it. Let's hear a word from Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. In 2013, I started a series at the Kentucky Derby Museum called the Legend Series. It was a great opportunity for me to sit down with the legends of the industry and ask them questions about their careers and taste their whiskeys. I've talked to great people like Julian Van Winkle, Edwin Foote, Harlan Wheatley, Chris Morris, Bill Samuels, Jimmy Russell, Jimmy Rutledge, and many, many, many more. It's been one of the most important events of my career. And now as I go into building the eighth season of the Legend Series for the Kentucky Derby Museum, I just look back on it in awe. It's also where I made my first connection with the fellas here at Bourbon Pursuit. You may have heard the story where Ryan showed up and forgot to turn on the microphone. We still razz him about that. But it really was a great, great moment I think not just for me or the Kentucky Derby Museum, but for all of Bourbon. The Legend Series was really one of the first high-level, high-education events that allowed people to get really connected to a master distiller or a CEO and learn about what makes them tick. And I'm very glad to see that today we know everybody's mash bill, we know people's business procedures, And you have companies like Heaven Hill who are creating diagrams for social media about airflow in a warehouse. So much has changed in eight years. And the people who are most to be credited with this are you. You, the consumer, have more power today than ever before. And let me tell you, the whiskey distillers pay attention a lot more to what you think than they do the USA Today, or the New York Times. You are the most powerful person in the all the equation of American whiskey. They follow what you say on social media. They follow what you listen to, what you read, and they want to know your opinion constantly. So join me in the further pursuit of knowledge, and let's ask people to open up and tell us more about their distilleries. Some people may think it's unfathomable to know what's going behind the scenes when they're making a price increase or what they're thinking when they're changing their barrel entry proof. But eight years ago, Heaven Hill didn't disclose their mash bills. Now, they freely tell you every single grain that goes into their whiskeys. So things can change. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, Make sure you're following me on Twitter and Instagram so you can come to next year's Kentucky Derby Legend Series. And you can find me at Fred Minnick. Again, at Fred Minnick. Cheers. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. 
All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout, and if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or thebourbonconcierge.com and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Welcome, everybody. This is the 36th recording of the Bourbon Community Roundtable. This is where we talk about what's happening in bourbon, bourbon culture, bourbon news. We've got a lot of topics to cover, but, you know, this is also the beginning and how we're kicking off Bourbon Heritage Month. So, everybody, welcome to Bourbon Heritage Month. It's kind of like uh, our Super Bowl, if we will, right? We're finally here uh, doing that. But, you know, not only does Bourbon Heritage Month start to kick off, but one of the biggest things is this is also turning into festival season. You know, we just wrapped up Bourbon on the Banks. Uh, there's one called Kentucky's Edge that'll be coming up in the first week of October. However, uh, Fred's Super Bowl here is here in uh, in two weeks. So, Fred, you getting getting mighty pumped for Bourbon and Beyond? Yeah, Bourbon and Beyond is right around the corner. I've got two other festivals right before that one, but Bourbon and Beyond is my baby. Uh, I work on it year round. We've been working so hard on it. Obviously, we got the Foo Fighters, ZZ Top, um, uh, Allison Krauss, Robert Plant, Zach Brown Band. We got all these incredible bands, but we also have, uh, you know, Graham Elliott from Top Chef, and we have a lot of uh, a lot of cool panels. Some of you all are on the panels. Nick uh, Jordan's there on behalf of Breaking Bourbon, but uh, I'm very proud of the uh, curation of the panels this year. And it's just an incredible, incredible lineup of, of education and, and cocktailing. Yeah. I mean, do you want to kind of give people a little bit of a, a teaser on what some of these panels are so they can go out and. Yeah. So, well, one year moderating Kenny is like, what is a master distiller? And it's something that we in our community, we talk about all the time. Like what is a master distiller? I mean, right now, technically Brian, who's just a lawyer could be a master distiller without even going any kind of like training for it. Uh, we're, I'm moderating a panel uh, about the history of slavery in American whiskey. This is the very first time that anybody in our industry has approached this. And um, I want people to realize that, you know, this is something that, you know, it we, we kind of like avoided a lot. But you have people like Fawn Weaver um, and, you know, who's bringing it to the forefront and making sure people want to talk, you know, make sure people talk about it because it is something important that it was a part of the American whiskey heritage. And I don't think we should just like gloss over it with, uh, and so that, that's a, uh, that's a big seminar. We've also got one called uh, bourbon disruptors. Uh, I'm excited about Brian's panel that he's doing. It's called uh, whiskey's dark past. You know, there's been a lot of murders. There's been a lot of bootlegging, uh, all kinds of shenanigans have been associated with, uh, with American whiskey. And, and so 
have some some deep ones, and then we have some like real basic, like high how to make a highball and a, how to make a Manhattan and an old fashioned. We have a lot of stuff like that as well. So light ones as, as well as the hardcore ones. Yeah, and I think at least all of us we're super excited to actually be there, be a part of it, be on the panels. And you know, while we're doing that, let's go ahead and introduce all of our guests that are here, or sorry, our typical roundtable members that are here today. So uh, let's start off with somebody who who might not be able to be here for that much longer because uh, he's getting ready to start batting down the hatches as uh, as the hurricane starts making his way. So Blake from Florida, checking in. How are you, buddy? Doing well. How are y'all? <laughs> uh, we're dry. I kind of sneak sneak in a little bit. Yeah, it's uh been quite the week. We, um, you know, I'm kind of a, a little bit of a procrastinator on the on the storm side, but this one looks like we could get a little bit. So uh, yeah, no school for the next two days at least. <laughs> well, good deal. We'll make sure you uh, you stay safe out there. You know, we're all uh, we're all making sure that you know everything is everything's good for you as well as uh, all the other. Floridian bourbon residents that are down there. So hopefully everybody is staying safe and, and heeding all the warnings of, of evacuating if you actually need to evacuate. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. But the street continues. I just got to throw that out there. The street continues. I've got <laughs> my introduction on the round table. Absolutely. This qualifies. <laughs> it this sure qualifies. does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Blake, if you need to go back, tend to family, please, do, please go for it, man. Thanks for, thanks for chiming in here. No, I'm good for a few minutes. Uh, are we into question? Where Where are we at? Not yet. We're we're just old. We just started going through the the table, just going around the horn. So, uh, we'll let you, you know, yeah, we'll let you take a break. So, uh, Brian, you go ahead and take next. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me again. This is Brian with Sippin' Corn. You can find me on Twitter and Facebook at Sippin' Corn, Instagram too, Sippin' Corn, and online at BourbonJustice.com and SippinCorn.com. And just to echo. Fred's comments. Um, I, probably no one is 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 as excited as he is, but I'm I might be second place. Uh, got rained out last year for my bourbon workshop, so I'm really excited about uh, doing it this this year. And Fred, thanks for including me. Yeah, absolutely. And Nick, let's go ahead. Breaking bourbon. Let's hear it. All right. Thanks, Kenny. Uh, I'm Nick from Breaking Bourbon. BreakingBourbon.com. Uh, check us out on social media at Breaking Bourbon. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, I will not be able to make Bourbon and Beyond this year, but uh, Jordan will be there. I will say I am pretty disappointed. It was a pretty uh, fantastic festival last year, even with uh, the the day, the rain out the second day. And, uh, you know, I think anybody who's going to be making it out there probably won't be disappointed. So I'm sure, Fred, you're probably going nuts now, still getting ready for this thing. But um, yeah, it's a pretty fantastic Bourbon Festival. and seems, seems like it's only getting better year after year. Well, thanks, guys. I got to tell you, you know, it means a lot to me hearing you all say that because, you know, getting rained out, it was like it was like a, a gut punch. And it was just so it was really devastating because we had to cancel the other festival, which is the Hard Rock Festival, Louder Than Life, the next weekend. So all, all three days were canceled. So we're really hoping and praying that we don't we have great weather <laughs> and. We're at, a, we're at a better location that can handle the rain. So like it, it's at the fairgrounds, it's like right across from the actual expo center building. And it's like that uh, flat plane. And um, it's a much more, it's not as beautiful as Champions Park uh, with all the trees, but it's something that, you know, is if, if this thing floods, the whole city's underwater. <laughs> there's going to be a new meter stick that's going to be on the side of the bridges to show the the great flood of 20 uh 2019 if that's what it is knock on wood yeah let's we're not going to have it it's gonna be remember <laughs> the first year it was hotter than hell out the second year it was just torrential downpour third year it's got to be just clear skies that's what it has that's to be it. that's it's gonna it be perfect yep all right so let's jump into it so the first topic of conversation is kind of a big one uh you know we've had Trey Zoller on the show before, good friend of the show from Jefferson's. And it was announced last week that Pernod Ricard is going to acquire Castle Brands, which Jefferson's a part of that portfolio, for $223 million. So it's good to see that Pernod is still uh, still on the hot streak of buying a lot of stuff. You know, I was just looking at uh, Castle Brands' website. Of course, like Jefferson's is the one that kind of screams out to a lot of us. Um, but they've got they've got an Irish cream and an Irish vodka. They've got uh, Gosling's rum. They've got Aaron whiskey, which I'd never really 
uh, come around before. Uh, but again, it's a it's a bigger portfolio, but it's uh, it's pretty good to see this sort of thing. You know, we've been not really uh, not accustomed to seeing a lot of these uh, these brands start getting acquired. Now, Pernod is actually kind of on a buying streak. It seems a lot recently. Um, do you all kind of see? this is a, a trend that's going to continue to happen. Like, do you think these more smaller brands are going to continue to keep getting swallowed up by a lot of these big ones? One thing that I noticed about this, and I know, I, I know what they're paying for them. Obviously 223 million sounds like a lot of money, but for these larger companies, it, it's really, to me, that's a, that's a low amount for a brand like Jefferson's, which really is a workhorse uh, I mean, that, that's a good selling brand that, you know, that alone could have probably, so, you know, you know, five years ago when you had uh, high West sell for $175 million, you know, Jefferson's was 10 times the brand of high West at that point. So I think, and I know what, I know what rabbit hole sold, but I can't really say, and I felt like that was a low amount as well. And and so I feel like they're getting these 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 brands that might be uh, in debt and they may not have as much like, uh, um, you know, may not they uh, I, I don't know how Perno is doing this, but that is not a lot of money for for Castle Brands. I just don't I just don't think that there was anyone else looking to buy them. And so right now you have the big companies and I don't know if they're out there uh, looking to buy up you know, brands, unless it's like White Claw at the moment. You know, the White Claw is the hot one. And, and so I guess mm-hmm. uh, that, you know, I come from the, te- I always say that, well, I come from the tech side. And so seeing things in the, you know, couple hundred million of dollars of acquisitions aren't, you know, it doesn't really, I don't really bat an eye at it anymore. Um, so you said that 223 million is just really not a lot. Um, and you think that it, it also could be, um, are there really only like just a, tiny handful of big players in this game that actually have the capital to acquire. And if they already have something that's in their portfolio, do they need to continue to keep acquiring? Yeah. Let's look at the brands that uh, the, the big, uh, the big portfolios, Brown Forma, Pernod Ricard, Diageo, you throw Proximo in there, uh, Beam Centauri, obviously, uh, Kieran, which has four roses would, you know, you could throw them in there. And, you know, there might be a couple others that could really move the needle, but you, you have to look at like, what are the, who has what? Uh, Sazerac, I forgot. Sazerac's a big player, obviously. Uh, and in 2009, Pernod basically got out of the American whiskey game when they, when they spun off, uh, um, you know, Barton and, you know, Wild Turkey. And so you had like this incredible, you know, they got rid of these, these great brands and, um, and, and now they're trying to get back into the game after it was too late. And Pernod's got a great Irish whiskey portfolio. So Irish whiskey is the only, you know, whiskey that's really hotter than bourbon. And, and it makes sense for them to, to try and get some juggernauts, but you know, they've got Smooth Ambler, Rabbit Hole Now and Jefferson. And I think they got Rabbit Hole really because of the facilities I think rabbit holes facilities have incredible potential for expansion. They fit right into the, like the tourism model and Jefferson's is a hot, hot brand. Smooth Ambler too has got, you know, they're, they, they've penetrated a, a lot of really good markets. So they, they made some interesting moves. Uh, and I think they did them uh, at a, you know, whoever negotiated their deals, I think probably did a very good job for them. Yeah, I, you know, Nick or Brian, do you kind of see this as as Fred said it? Is this Perno kind of like crawling back into the market a little bit? Um, you know, if you know if you got rid of Wild Turkey at the wrong time because you thought it was a you know basically a bad stock, and you sold when the you sold it when it's low, and you know you bought it when it's high, like are they trying to like flip the script for themselves here. Well, I, I think they they definitely trying to do that, but they're they're filling their roster with D League players in, instead of what they lost. And I think their problem is going to be capacity. I mean, how can they increase production of any of those uh, without huge distilleries to be able to churn this out? I, I see that as their issue. I mean, they they can get some from Rabbit Hole and they can get some from Smooth Ambler, but that's a ways off. Um, 
Jefferson's is still just bottling in Crestwood, right? I mean, they don't have a whole lot of capacity of their own. Uh, they're still sourcing. So where's it going to come from? So I, I see it as problematic. They're, they're buying D league players and they can't, they're not going to be able to increase production. You know, I think that to kind of piggyback on the sourcing and that's, you know, probably the comments that were at least that I saw, you know, here and there with, of course, the focus on Jefferson's in the in the bourbon world um, with respect to this acquisition. You know, that's the question you think about High West, Smooth Ambler, they're, they've got distilleries, they've got the, that kind of capability. You know, with Jefferson's, for example, it really is the, the, the brand that's bought, the distribution, you know, the, the labels, the, that kind of thing. So kind of to Brian's point, it's that, you know, it's that want to get back in the game, want to get in, in the game. I think there is still a lot of growth potential in general, but it's what is that, you know, what are you going to do with that? So now they've got the brands, now they've got to pull out from, you know, pull out from behind that and probably invest quite a bit more. Jefferson's too, like they go from uh, a company – that didn't necessarily have the ability to walk into a company like uh, Brown Foreman and and strike a deal for 5,000 barrels of stock. I'm not saying that's going to happen now with Pinot Ricard, but now with Pinot Ricard, I mean, Trey Zoller's got muscle. Like mm-hmm. Castle, Castle Brand was is like, uh, you know, that was like, you know, a triple-A baseball team, you know, in comparison to Pernod Ricard, who would be the Boston Red Sox or the Yankees, you know. So the buying power uh, that they have to be, you know, on the source market, I mean, it just went up because they they can they can strike deals that he could never dream of before. When they start sourcing from Wild Turkey. <laughs> yeah, or MGP, which, you know, they, uh, they own the facilities after – uh, after Seagram's had to shutter all their stuff, uh, they got the facility in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, and Diageo got, you know, Crown Royal. And they're like, uh, you know, who got the better end of the deal on that? Because they can never make, Pernod Ricard can never make that Lawrenceburg, Indiana distillery work. And they sold it to LDI and that, you know, that became kind of like the source capital. But uh, so that would be ironic if they end up sourcing from Wild Turkey and uh, MGP. Mm-hmm. And I guess uh, another question to kind of throw at you all about this is, do we see this is going to be a, a lot tougher game going into this? You know, we, we had Trey on the, on the podcast before like, last year and we talked to him and we said like, is it getting harder now with sourcing? Like are people kind of treading in your territory or you had had all these relationships before and now you've got people that are on your turf, barrel prices are going up. How can you maintain, you know, with not actually having a distillery that can pump significant volume, you know, is this, was this a good buy for, for Pernod? Like it's, that's a tough question. And I think, uh, I think Brian kind of alluded to that. Now I wouldn't say that they're a, you know, D player or anything like that. I, I, I still, I'm a fan of Jefferson's. I still like the whiskey they put out. Um, however, in regards of an operation, it might've been a, a kind of a weird acquisition in my opinion. Anybody have any thoughts of like, is, is because they don't actually do a lot of distilling or heavy distilling? Like, was it a good acquisition or is it just something that, you know, as Nick said too, it, it's just maybe a brand recognition thing. Now, yeah. You have to, you have to understand like this business is driven by brands. Like we look at things from where the liquid liquid comes from, but this business is really driven by like a name and, and, and they're like it or not, whether you, um, if, if you, if you follow it or not, the Jefferson's Ocean is one of the is one of the best like marketing ploys of of, of the last 10, 15 years in American whiskey. Now I remember asking, I, I remember asking Trey for to seeing a man, manifest of his barrels. And I, I thought he was gonna punch me. But you know, you've got you you have some people who disbelieve in that it's a the ocean barrel uh, concept. But he does put them out there, and it's been one of the best like uh, marketing you know conversations that are, or marketing boys have turned into conversations. Um, at least in my world, everyone's like, "Is it real? Is it real?" He tasted it, you know. So Absolutely. It's, it's one of those things that it's probably uh, just just on that alone, and the fact that Jefferson's is is everywhere. 
I think it was a great, great acquisition for Pernod. So there's another comment here from Dan Walski. Um, you know, he sees Jefferson's brand uh, is probably worth the investment. Uh, however, he wouldn't be surprised to see it now eventually start getting separated from Kentucky Artisan and then becoming uh, like a visitor destination of its own now. It's a pretty good theory, I think, for uh, for what this could potentially be and where it could go. Think about the Kentucky Owl situation, for example, you know, immediately it's the plans for a gigantic, a gigantic park and distillery, you know, so how are we going to see something like that? Is that going to be the growth plan for or not in this case, or are they just going to keep, you know, continuing with the brand as it is and sourcing and kind of doing business as usual. Be curious to see how that changes over time. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, And I think, uh, you know, there's, there's also something that kind of it, it kind of jogs my memory when I think about this, when we look at, uh, you know, we had Corky, uh, what was last week's podcast. Uh, we've had Cave from rabbit hole on, and there's always like this, a lot of these, uh, CEOs, they say a lot of the same things of like, we're never going to sell. This is going to remain in the family forever. And then it's like, is it though? Like, is it like, is somebody puts a fat check in front of your face? Like it's gotta be pretty hard to, to turn down. There's always a number. I agree. Well, I think you have to look, you know, let's take a look at at those two particular brands. Cave had a lot of investors um, and Corky did all this with his own money and he's got trust lined up and everything. It always comes down to the money. And look, man, I'm in business. I don't come for money. Uh, I've had to work for everything I've gotten. And when you sit down in a room with, with money people, you know, they always want something. So, you know, you give up something to you give up shares of your company or something to get what you want out of them. But this, you know, there comes a point where they're like, okay, we've had a good time on this ride. Where's our payout? We want out now. We want to cash out. And so it, everything depends upon how your business structure is. And when you have these small distillers, um, you know, one of their, one of their end games is selling just is. Yep. No, I agree. Uh, and I think, uh, for anybody that is ever getting into business, like you always want to think like, yes, I do it for the passion. I do it for the, for the joy of what it is. But at the end of the day, if somebody puts a big fat check in front of your face, that's, it's part of the American dream too. So you can't, you can't discount that. So, uh, you know, as we kind of, we'll just kind of switch gears a little bit, uh, and this is one that uh, I actually kind of like this one because uh, Fred sent this a little bit before we started here. And this was the fact that um, PBR is getting ready to start making their very own whiskey. Uh, so I will drop the link here into the chat. Uh, I'm also going to drop it into a, um, uh, the, the YouTube chat as well. So you can kind of see it. But really what it is, is PBR is now making a whiskey that's been aged for a complete total of five seconds. So uh, that should probably already kind of get your blood flowing a little bit. So they have recently talked about they have a new uh, hard seltzer that's coming out with 8%. Uh, but now they're actually going to be doing a 40% whiskey, uh, sorry, 40% ABV that has been aged for five seconds. So uh, Fred kind of talked about this one. Fred, does this make your blood boil a little bit? Yeah, I have two words for uh, PBR. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, you know, PBR is trying to be trendy, and they got some headlines with this, but you know, in, given that we're we we have a brand that's basically repackaged Zima, taking over the the space of uh, uh, millennial consumption, and actually, really, White Claw penetrates the entire world right now. Um, anything is possible with what will be the next big thing. And PBR has got a big brand behind it. And I just, I just wish they would, that, you know, this is a, this is a mockery of, of whiskey. So I just, I hate everything about it. <laughs> Ryder, Nick, do you share any of the, the, the same, the same feelings? You know, I, I, I kind of always look, I, I do think it's interesting. It really created a buzz. I think people who may not, 
normally think about whiskey or bourbon or, or what they really are. You know, I think that just that buzz about that it's going to go into a container, into an oak container, it's going to be aged for five seconds or, you know, whatever they end up doing with it. If, if anything, that's an awareness, you know, piece of, well, how, number one, how good is it going to be? You know, so for somebody that is just doing shots at a bar, they never think about anything, you know, as, as far as, you know, whether they like things that are, you know, higher quality, you know, longer aged, et cetera. What am I really drinking? Where does it get its color from? Things of that nature. It may cause some people to kind of get curious about what's really there. And I think once people start getting educated, reach the point of, you know, anybody who's listening to this or watching this right now, you know, you're obviously, this is much farther behind, you know, where your journey started or, you know, much farther behind where you are now, where your journey started. But I think that's the interesting part about it is kind of just that awareness in what's probably a younger crowd that's going to be more, you know, uh, in tune with this or tasting this or whatever the case might be, you know, where it might make some people curious about uh, exploring a little further and eventually getting to the point where they respect what's going on with the actual, you know, creation and aging and things of that nature. So I think it's interesting. I don't hate it in the same way that I guess that Fred does, um, you know, will it succeed? I don't know. You know, it's, it's different than the beer in that sense of, you know, the beer, I, I see the market for it. This, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I guess we'll see. Yeah. I think you look at it like everybody wants to try to create something and you know, what, what's PBR PBR is not supposed to be some glorious luxury brand, right? Like this is supposed to be like bottom shelf, like how, like how fast can we get this out the door and, you know, really just churn product. Um, and this might be following that same exact suit. I'm not too sure if this is supposed to be a, a premium product by any means. Yeah. They're not trying to be premium. And I, I guess from my standpoint, it PBR, five second whiskey has no impact on me whatsoever. And I don't care about it. Um, but I see where it's, it's going. Like, like Nick said, it's going to be at the, it's going to be at the bar for a shot and hopefully it overtakes, um, you know, some of these other flavored whiskeys, which I don't care about either as the, you know, the new hot shot for college age through mid twenties. Um, and then there's going to be a market for that. And there always will be in my day, it was Jägermeister and you know, that's awful. <laughs> there'll always be something. So, you know, knock, knock your socks off, go ahead, do a five second whiskey, try to sell it by, by the shot to 24 year olds and I'll keep drinking what I've been drinking. So, you know, you talk about flavored whiskey there. Have you all seen the, the new phenomenon of screwball, the peanut butter flavored whiskey? Oh, yeah, I think I had it first at your house to tell you the truth, <laughs> but it's starting to, it's starting to catch on now. Like it's, it's out here now. I see it here. It's, I mean, it's in all the forums. People are talking about it. It's like, it's like the white claw of whiskey right now. That was the first time I had, it was uh bourbon and beyond last year. Yep. <laughs> so I don't want to call myself a trendsetter, but you know, we didn't have, you might be. <laughs> <laughs> so shout out to Tony from Keg and Bottle, who actually uh, gave me that probably about a year and a half ago. And he said, Kenny, I kid you not, this is going to be the next fireball. And so, I mean, he, like he said, a year and a half ago, he gave it to me. And now all of a sudden, like people are buying it. It's taken off a little bit, but you got to like peanut butter. That's for sure. Because it yeah. definitely, definitely has that, uh, that flavor to it. Okay, then. Like it or hate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Right position. Yeah. <laughs> so, so back to, back to whiskey, uh, you know, there was something else that came out uh, a few weeks ago on, on geek.com talking about the, the artificial tongue. Do y'all remember this? So mm -hmm. I'll talk about it. So the artificial tongue can taste the might subtle, subtle, subtle differences. Okay. Wait, hold on. Wait, hold on. Oh, uh, okay. I got it. You what do if it. the art, I wonder what the artificial tongue thinks about the five second whiskey. I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I don't know if that's what it's really made for though. Who knows? Right. I guess we'll find out one of these days, but, um, this was built by Scottish engineers and it's ultimately made to sit there and try to find, uh, counterfeit frauds or anything like that. That's on the, on the open market. And of course, you know, we talk about it with bourbon, you know, having counterfeit pappy all the time and stuff like that. Uh, however, you're going to see this even larger scale in the, uh, the Scotch world as well. Um, so Fred, what are your kind of thoughts on this artificial tongue? 
Well, I've actually talked to quite a few people about this who are like in a taster's role. And I think most everyone knows I do a lot of tasting. And I think it's uh, I, I think it's great if it's not like, you know, stealing. Um, I, I'm curious to see like the data that like goes into it, like how they how they create it. Because I know of one like, you know, algorithm that's out there that's been taking people's uh, tasting notes and applying them to, um, you know, basically putting a collective, uh, you know, algorithm together of like what to say from uh, people various, like if you're, if you're writing tasting notes on Reddit or if you have tasting notes on a blog or, or anything that's scannable, there is now like, there's some spiders out there that's out there taking them and they're applying them elsewhere. So, uh, robot tasting. So if, it, if it's something like that, I'm not a fan of it, but if it's something that really actually adds to the, you know, our world, I'm, I'm all for it. But, you know, it, the thing is, is like, can it, it it's a, the right now they're marketing as like spotting fakes mm-hmm. and that's great. But I wonder what their next iteration will be because, you know, um, eventually it's going to be about like, you know, this is how you taste. So this is what you're going to like. And, you know, I think that's cool. Yeah. I think this could definitely lead to a lot of different things. I think, I think finding the counterfeits is a, it's kind of like a, it's, I don't know, it's like a gateway. Like it's, I don't think it's going to have a a large purpose at first. Like I think you need to cover a little bit more blanket area here when you're trying to figure out exactly what can you do with this technology. Uh, It's got to be a little bit more uniform, a little more universal of, of actually how does this catch on? Uh, into the point where, you know, you know, Fred, you taste a lot. However, like, is this something where it's like, okay, we've got, uh, six panelists that are humans. And then our seventh is this AI machine, right. To make sure like everything works like within that, this distillery, like, you know, we've been going for utilizing people for the longest time to, you know, nose and taste and actually understand what this, what this is supposed to taste like and which typical batch it goes in. But we're human. Like what is human? It's, it's, you have error. Error is built in versus mm-hmm. a computer. Whereas if you're feeding it data, like it's just computations. So, uh, you know, Nick or, or Brian, like, do you kind of see this like much more spreading its way out into uh, maybe distillery should start looking into this kind of technology as well? So I'm just waiting for the movie where artificial tongues go rogue and like <laughs> one of them decides it's going to go and replace everybody's whiskey with like rapid age whiskey because it's got the perfect profile and, and there's just insanity and chaos, you know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I'm visually just looking as like little tongues across the street, like just like running around, like overtaking the rogue tongues. Yeah. <laughs> rogue tongues. I mean, I think I, there could be great applications for it. Um, you know, they, I guess the question is, is it going to replace uh, not necessarily master distillers, but you know, people that, you know, blend and, and, you know, testing that takes place, you know, within distilleries and that producers, you think about kind of the non-scientific nature of so much of this, and even just tasting notes, like you're talking about. I mean, it's a very non-scientific process in the sense. And that's one of the kind of magical things about whiskey. Um, You know, would we, you know, if there was inside each label or on each bottle, kind of like a, a very specific profile of, a particular whiskey or almost a map that was scientifically put together, you know, would that be something that, you know, would enhance the experience? Do people want that? You know, is that the end result of what we're even, you know, kind of dealing with here? Um, I think it's interesting from that aspect. At the same time, I do think one of the great things about whiskey is kind of the human and the art of whiskey. So it's almost a kind of a weird dichotomy of technology and, and kind of that, you know, artful human interaction that, you know, you don't want to see that necessarily overtaken, but you do want to, you know, you do want to add you know, air value when you can. And, you know, there's so many whiskeys they are so expensive that I could definitely see a, you know, a value proposition for somebody to say, Hey, is this something I might like, you know, for example, or how do we design a better, you know, a better whiskey? I'm just yeah. really, I'm really excited that there's been tech applied in, um, in a valuable way. Usually tech people apply it in the most into rapid aging or something They're, everyone's trying to fix that when there's really not a, a problem other than waiting. Um, but I'm just, I'm just glad that somebody 
in the tech world is applying applying their uh, know-how and skills to a, a very particular area that we do probably could use some consistency. Yeah, I, I agree with Nick. I'll, I'll take it a step further, though. I mean, I, I think while it's it's beneficial in some respects uh, to have this AI tasting because the AI is not going to be thrown off with what you had for lunch or what you had for dinner. Um, it's but it's on the other hand, it's going to be much more sterile of a of an experience of a of a description of what you're supposed to be tasting. And so much, as Nick said, is so much of, of drinking whiskey is the experience. And it can change if you've got a steak versus something else. And it can change in the mood. And I've been to a, a presentation Fred did. It, it, music can affect what you're, what you're experiencing. And AI is never going to get to, well, famous last words, AI is never going to get to that <laughs> level of the experience that you can have with whiskey. And if I've got a piece of Gouda that I'm eating with it, AI is not going to be able to tell me, again, famous last words, how that's going to affect what, what I'm experiencing at that moment. Um, so it's, it's nice, but it's, to me, it's sort of like a party trick. And we all know that Jim Beam or somebody would hack it to give like something like a Legion, uh, like a 95. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so now, Brian, I'm picturing like VR goggles, some scent thing <laughs> going on here. <laughs> Headphones with your favorite music. You know, you That's feel right. like you're right there. Exactly. All the right. taste and smells right at your at your disposal. Yep. You see Actually, that in a few Metallica, years. Metallica does that. Uh, they have uh, one of their tasters. Uh, play various, uh, have everybody put on, uh, you know, special headphones and they have to taste like five different whiskeys. It's all their whiskey, but they, the people say like the whiskeys taste different based on the music they're listening to. And the, hmm. there's new, new evidence that suggests that what you listen to has a much deeper effect on, on how you taste. So I am definitely on board with what Brian just said there, that the AI will never be able to pick up uh, more of the human element, at least in, probably in our lifetime, I think. I mean, I don't know. No, I think I think you're right. I don't think it's going to have that human element to it. However, I think there's there's a lot of potential of what this could do uh, in regards of thinking that you want to create more – uh, say a brand that has a very, very specific kind of character. And so you take, uh, you take one ounce out of a particular barrel, then you get a, a chemical breakdown of like the 30 different things that are in it. And it's like, you know, X percentage of something versus Y percentage of another. And then you kind of figure out exactly, okay, I need this kind of percentages. And they all start equaling out. All right, dump these barrels together. And now we eat now, now we kind of see this, uh, this sort of specific profile, uh, that could be coming. So, could be completely different uh, in a way of building new brands versus just sitting there and saying like, Oh, okay, we'll just go and make sure this is, this is, this is not Pappy. This is just regular WOL. -er. And you know, the thing about checking if something's fake or not, most of the time when that matters, it's sealed and you want to keep it that way. So that application is a, is a bit of a struggle, you know, because you're probably rarely going to find a purchase contingent on, you know, opening, pouring, tasting, or testing, or whatever the case might be. Yeah, how would you like to be the guy who just dropped $1.5 million on a bottle of McKenna, gets it tested, like, oh, yeah, no, <laughs> uh, this is actually a uh, Glenfiddich 12-year-old. You person. almost don't want to know. Yeah. You, you almost, at that point, you're like, no, just keep those things away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's definitely a bad side to that, too. <laughs> it, you know, and as we start coming, going down this path, you know, this was something of uh, news that happened last week. You know, there has been a tear on the secondary market lately. Like there's just groups are disappearing left and right. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. 
Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. There has been a tear on the secondary market lately. Like there's just groups are disappearing left and right. And even the the secondary backup BSM group that was over on MeWe, Maywe, whatever it is, is that's now gone as well. So it's not like it's just Facebook. It looks like this is like a virus that's continually trying to spread and it's just getting knocked out sort of wherever it goes. Um, now, don't get me wrong. There's still a few groups that are remaining, you know, they're probably around like the two to 3000 member mark, but there's nowhere near, uh, even on the BSM on MeWe was like, almost 10,000 or above. So it seems that where everybody flocks to, these are just getting canned left and right. Um, now, I've tried to reach out, haven't really heard anything of in regards of why it happened or anything like that. Uh, however, it just seems there's there's no safe haven right now. Um, do you all kind of see this as, is this going to be the new norm or is it just like, it's just hot for the moment, we'll have to wait, ride this wave, uh, and then maybe here in another three months, we'll, we'll be back up to where it was. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of what and when, um, and that, that might change over time. You know, as we're seeing right now, it's certainly changing how the communication is done. Um, probably the bigger question is if we have these, call it a, a period of a drought, for example, which is interesting because this is happening, you know, before we start seeing some of the big fall releases and things of that nature, you've got to ask yourself, is is that going to change the, the, like, the primary market? You know, because how much of the primary market is driven by what ends up happening on the secondary market? You know, so a lot of people buying, you know, based on the idea that they're going to be able to turn around and sell for a profit if that is no longer in place or that, you know, you knock out 50 percent or some reasonable percentage of, pe- you know, people that are able to do that or see their ability to do that. Does that start driving prices down on the primary? I think it'll be interesting to see how that, you know, kind of goes over the the upcoming months here. Yeah, I think we're going to see this. Uh, and, and not only that is, uh, I think Brett Atlas had a post that was on Blake's group uh, this past week of, uh, you know, the the new E.H. Taylor uh, Amaranth has been now been released. However, nobody can figure out what a price should be on it because there's no room to, there's no place to uh, auction off and figure out what's going to be. Uh, even today, uh, there were, I think, like 72 birthday bourbons that were sold at uh, Old Forester Distillery downtown to kind of commemorate the Old Forester birthday bourbon and George Garvin Brown's birthday. Uh, however, I haven't seen a whole heck of a lot of them show up on anywhere. So, you know, this is, this could be a sign of the times that you know, hopefully you're buying it to to hold on to it because finding the outlets to sell it is getting uh, a lot harder now. It's definitely interesting. Um, I, you know, I, I'm beta testing an app right now and I've been asked if like people can do that. And I'm like, well, you know, I, I, I have to, I have to like seriously look at that now. And I'm thinking of like the potential liability associated with it. I'm like, uh, you know, maybe you don't. You know, maybe in your chat, your own little private chat group, which I can't see. But um, it's it's fascinating to me how this this domino effect. And I would love I would love to sit down with uh, Mark Zuckerberg, an interview request I've put out many times, by the way, never going to happen, probably. But I would love to find out if like he's had a hand in it or someone at Facebook had, you know, I would love to hear the rationale behind it. But I know they've said some things, but. 
it, there's more to it. There's got to be more to it. I, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me, especially with this new, with this, this new social media site dumping it so quickly. It just, it, it's odd. It's just I so agree. Odd. It's, it's got to yeah. be coming yeah. down from somewhere else. I mean, Facebook. It makes you wonder if brands are involved. Sorry, if Brian. Brands. You know, yeah. if we've got brands or somebody specific, you know, with uh, intent, you know, and is watching this more closely and specifically. I think that's a great question. And they have been watching the these markets for, for some time because they would even like, uh, you know, price their whiskey to uh, to combat it. But I would I would argue that it may not be a brand behind it, but a very powerful retailer, you know, who. Mm-hmm who wants that money um, and knows that that money's out there. They want, they want your dollar. They don't want you to buy it at, you know, SRP and then flip it. I mean, there's any number of areas this could go. There's any number of people who would like to see it stop. Um, but I do know this. I, I, I know that most of the, like the state authorities don't really care. You know, I mean, I've talked to them like, yeah, eh, eh, don't really care. You know, but like Texas does. Texas cares, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, all the control states actually. But, you know, this is doesn't seem to be like uh, any kind of state leading it. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. The control states, they don't want competition. Pennsylvania doesn't want any competition oh, there. Oh, no. <laughs> but, you know, what cracks me up about Pennsylvania is every year they send out a press release and, oh, we lost like three or four of them this year, or one was broken in, uh, in transport. And I'm like, wow, I bet it suddenly got lost on the uh, the state majority leader's uh, front, st- front step and or, <laughs> you know, the uh, the bottle accidentally broke after it was consumed uh, by the director's house, you know, or at the director's house. I mean, it's just it's all kinds of silly with uh, with Pennsylvania. Well, it's control states in general, but you know, I think when we when we look at just the secondary market, you know, we've talked about it in regards of like how this built a culture. This is probably how bourbon has amassed to how big it is because most people wouldn't even know about a lot of brands if they didn't see them on. The secondary markets to begin with. I mean, it's we all have our stories. So I think it'd be uh, it'd be interesting to kind of see where this is going to go. Uh, you know, me when I look at it, I think this was this is a, a critical and crucial part of of really what made bourbon what it is today. And you know, there's going to have to be somewhere where people can basically value this as sort of currency. Maybe it's trading. You know, I'm I don't like to sit there and say like, yeah, go get a birthday bar birthday bourbon for 150 bucks and go try to sell for 300. Like I'm I'm not all about that. However, it's like if you can get a birthday bourbon for 150, uh, yet you can't get a George T. Stag this year, and that's just part of the trade, then that's great, right? That's that's something that you're able to get your hands on. You can kind of trade your way there, you know, and you start with a paper yeah. clip and you end up with a plane. But you know, that's that's essentially like where I would like to be able to see this because it's all about getting the the you know the bourbon that you want in your hands and kind of how I to get it. But yeah, I mean, I think you're right. But for to the point of like this, this help kind of like spread the enthusiasm. Um, I know like the people in the groups, if you, if you put it on scale, you're looking at maybe at most like 2 million or something, uh, at least the various groups that I knew of. And that's not a lot in the grand scheme of things, but those people were like everybody's influencer in their families, in their workplace. And they would be the people out there talking about bourbon. So, and it would, the, these groups kind of became communities and I was you know, I, I, I loved them, you know, I, I loved them because, or actually I loved them five years ago. You know, they, they changed quite a bit in the last couple of years, but, um, they, they were very, very engaging. You could talk history. You could talk, uh, about who distilled what, like, I mean, I remember having a conversation with someone educating him about Woodrow Wilson, um, which if you don't know, he was a master distiller at Stitzelweller for a very short period, but, you know, he made some good whiskey. And so I guess a, uh, you know, as we start thinking of other ways of uh, how is the bourbon market being hindered, you know, there's been uh, finally some data that's now coming out about the U.S. whiskey exports and the tariffs that are now happening uh, over in the EU. So when we start looking at this, uh, you know, I look at some of the data here and I'll, I'll, again, I'll drop the link in the chat for 
folks that want to be able to see this, you can see all these links in our show notes as well. Uh, but the Distilled Spirits Council came and said that there was a 21% decrease uh, from June 2018 to June to 2019 uh, that was all lost sales after shipments to Europe plummeted. So uh, we've got the data coming in. Um, you know, I know, Fred, you're, you're kind of close to this. Is there a way that things could eventually bounce back to, to help bourbon brands grow. And I will always say it again, that if somebody says, oh yeah, this is great because it means more bourbon on the shelves for me, you're in the wrong here. Okay. Think bigger. Well, uh, th there have been some really nice uh, trade related things that have happened. Like in a, in a couple of weeks, uh, I, I was invited to, to meet the uh, European Union uh, ambassador to the United States. Uh, and they're celebrating scotch irish and bourbon whiskey the you know the unique designations of them and like all the uh, all the countries are kind of coming together in washington dc to celebrate this and so from an industry perspective you know they have the ears of their legislators their ambassadors uh, their parliament or whatever um you know brexit also you know threw a wrinkle into it so in, in an odd way brexit could be you know, it could be good for for the tariffs, um, you know, for that particular portion. Um, but, you know, so those are a couple of the good things. But in, in, in all seriousness, you know, they're not letting up. You know, Europe is still very uh, hell-bent on applying pressure. And, you know, there's been reports that they want to apply more pressure, you know, in, in, in Mitch McConnell areas. So, yeah, it just... I just don't see this, you know, being good. And it's, and it's shut out small brands like the Topton Creek completely. And Kenny, I know you're a brand owner and, you know, you want to, let's say you want to open a, a, you have a small shop in Poland who absolutely loves the show, loves you, wants to make you his number one whiskey in his store. You won't find a distributor in that entire country that'll take your call. You know, it's just because of the tariffs. They don't want to pass that on. They're just not taking calls from small American whiskey companies. So it's no, and I, 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 Yeah, and I think this is, this is as I've mentioned before, I mean, this is so much bigger than just what you can get here on the shelves. Like this is, this is trying to grow the category as a whole to start taking on scotch as, as you know, the, the whiskey in the market. Uh, and we can't get to that level of scotch unless you have a, a fair playing field you know, across the board to be able to say like, okay, like let's get this in the hands of people in Australia and Zimbabwe and China and, uh, you know, in the EU as well. Like how can we grow this as a whole? Uh, and this is really where the tariffs are going to start really being that, that first sort of uh, hand slap, I guess you could say, is if you're trying to, to reach a new market, um, you know, all of a sudden, if you have a, if you've got a 30 or $40 bottle here in the States, I mean, you're, you're looking at doubling that uh, if not coming close to triple as you start getting, uh, you know, already just distribution overseas, but now the tariffs are adding a lot more to it. And if you can't compete with a, you know, $50, $60 bottle of scotch, then you're, you know, you're already setting yourself up for failure. And so, you know, as we start kind of rounding this out, you know, Nick and uh, Brian, I kind of want to get your sort of thoughts on this. If you have uh, any sort of inkling of, of what do you kind of see next, um, Maybe uh, if it's an election year, is there anything that could change, you know, after that as well? Nick, you go ahead and go first. <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to I was going to say the same. <laughs> um, you know, I it, it's I think it's tough to to say what's going to happen going forward. I'd be really curious to see, you know, what small brands are seeing the impact of this right now um, immediately. Um you know, like anything, I think there's the initial shock of it, but then, you know, demand is demand. So if that means the 20% increase in price or whatever the case might be, if the demand is there, um, over time might cause that to, you know, to become a non-issue. Um, but it, but it's a barrier, you know, of entry as a starting point. So when you th think about bourbon growing on a global scale and the potential it has on a global scale, you know, certainly that's a pretty, uh, a pretty immediate, you know, block of, of taking that first step for a lot of, you know, a lot of these brands um, on that larger scale. You know, what if you see 
this go on for a period of time, then suddenly it goes away. You know, do you have the opposite impact? Do you have suddenly a flood of, uh, you know, a flood of opportunity, a flood of brands that are saying, okay, now this opportunity just opened up. We're going to put pressure on actually doing this. Because if you think about all the brands that are out there, especially the small ones, how many of them are actually taking those steps right now to get overseas? Um, I'd be curious out of the, say, 1,000 or 1,200 distilleries, you know, in the U.S., for example, how many are saying, let's get on the shelves in Europe or let's get on the shelves in uh, Australia or Japan or whatever the case might be, uh, China, what's the market like over there? So it will be interesting to see how it plays out. You know, like anything, it's it's a global economy. We're going to see the push and pull. And I think ultimately the long-term play for bourbon, for U.S. whiskey is to be probably bigger than scotch, quite frankly. Uh, I personally think it's better. Uh, you know, so there's no really no reason why it can't be bigger or at least just as big. It's just a matter of time and what, you know, things are going to have to move and shift around and what dominoes are going to have to fall and when that's going to allow that to, uh, you know, to really gain some momentum and happen. Bourbon's got a long way before it catches scotch. And I'll tell you, like, this is why, this is why the, the tariffs are so frustrating to me is that, you know, bourbon became a unique product to the United States, largely in part because they were trying to get special designations so they would not get tariffed. After World War II, the country, the, the rest of the world basically tariffed uh, bourbon and opened the opened the markets for scotch to help the United Kingdom recover from World War II because, you know, they were bombed and, and, and everything. They, they took a much greater hit um, on the physical real estate of their country. And, and so they were places like Argentina, you know, was tariffing us like 200%. The United Kingdom actually had like limits of bourbon that they would allow in the country for a given year. And when they would actually, when the bourbon distillers would push to like, you know, have exports, you know, the French basically came back and said, Hey, why would we give you any kind of anything tariff free when bourbon doesn't mean anything to us? Like you have no special designation. Of course, the French, you know, being the home of cognac and champagne, have a very unique understanding of like designation for alcohol, and and so in 1958, they started the bourbon industry started banding together and working to make bourbon a unique product in the United States. And after that, in 1964, they then had the ability to negotiate and free trade agreements to peel away um, tariffs. And this, they 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 have been doing that since the 1960s and they've only just now gotten to the point where their uh, where their exports are, are over a billion dollars so that's why this is like so painful for for the industry it's like the bourbon has never been in these countries i mean you go to places like portugal and, and spain you see two you know 10 years ago you'd see uh two bottles now, you know, you still see only two bottles in most bars, but now you'll have some bars that will have 10, 20, 30. So and that's because the, the reduced tariffs or no tariffs have opened up the markets. And now with the tariffs coming back in, those markets are going to go away. And that's why it's so fucking frustrating. Fred, what immediate impact, if you were to kind of try to quantify the impact of the tariffs as a worst case, what immediate impact do you think that could have? Look at the next, say, two years, three years, for example. Well, you definitely saw some the smaller brands that were, you know, gambling on opening up markets in the, in Europe. You saw a lot of that. And now that's taken away, and now they're being forced to like, you know, market themselves here. And as you know, Americans have a very different taste of what whiskey is than the Europeans. So I would say, like, a small craft distiller could probably fool someone in Poland that their three year old bourbon. Uh, is actually good. Uh, you know, here, you know, you're not going to be able to fool someone who's used to, you know, Kentucky bourbon. So you basically take off, like basically change someone's business plan. The other one, I think Brown Foreman is in a super risk position. They've already mm -hmm. came out, said they're losing like 128 million um, a, a year ba based on Jack Daniels exports alone. So I think they are very vulnerable um, and, you know, they could, they could see some major, you know, reductions or some shifts in like what they, how they do things. But Jack Daniels is a very strong brand and, you know, they should be, they should be fine. Uh, one positive note, 
Pernod coming into American whiskey much stronger. That's another European country. It's another uh, European mm-hmm. ally to negotiate on behalf of American whiskey. And, and let me true. piggyback on that. I mean, when you, I'm by no means well traveled, but when I go there, there's, there's, you know, the, the two, three brands that you always see. There's, there's Bullet in every bar, there's Maker's Mark, and there's Jack Daniels. And beyond that, you've got to go to a specialty shop. Um, there is one in Bath, Independent Spirits, that if anyone goes uh, anywhere near there, you, you've got to go. Um, but it's, it's all these big brands. So the small brands can't meet the demand that they have here. So I think it is an issue for Brown Foreman with Jack Daniels, and it is an issue for Diageo bringing Bullet uh, over uh, over to Europe. Um, but they're all still making more bourbon than they've ever made. And Diageo is starting a whole nother damn new distillery. Um, I don't know the answer to this, and that's why I was trying to defer to Nick. But seeing the big distilleries continue to churn out bourbon at, at a record pace tells me they have faith that this is just a, a blip and it'll get resolved and they'll be able to open the European more. They'll get into India. They'll continue to push into Asia. And it, if they don't, we've got the same issue we had in the 60s and we'll all be drinking 20-year-old bourbon on the cheap. <laughs> well, there's there's a there's a big thing that's different now. You have tourism for years. You know, bourbon's been up and down, up and down. It's basically just all based off of what you're drinking. Well, now you have tourism, the tourism component. So these brands are trying to create a lot of lifestyle. And from a liquid perspective, we're still not back to where we were in the in the 70s from a production standpoint. So a lot of the money that they are spending is actually not on the liquid. It is on the lifestyle and tourism element, and that's. It's fun and sexy, but that's not getting bottles on the shelf. That's a good way to close it out. You know, as we started talking about, you know, at the very beginning of this, we kind of talked about the growth, the height, and now we're talking about like we must save bourbon because we got to make sure that these tariffs don't really affect it. And, you know, I, I think, uh, I think it, it'd be, it'd be pretty good to, if we could get in the inside walls, if there's like a meeting amongst like the top eight bourbon companies and they all try to predict and forecast and say like, well, why are you building a, 50,000 barrel warehouse and we're not starting yet. Like, what do you see that we're not seeing? So it'd be cool to kind of understand exactly if we could get somebody in the show that is a, uh, uh, I guess a, a bourbon economist that kind of can forecast out really what the next uh, 10 years look like. Uh, we'll, we'll put that on the, the to-do list for us. So, you know, with that, as we start kind of rounding this out, I want to say, gentlemen, thank you again for coming on the show. And thank you to everybody too, uh, that was sitting here watching it live. I think we are concurrent uh, watchers somewhere around like 75 at some point. So uh, 63. So that was awesome. Thank you so much for everybody that was on here. So we at least had over 100 that joined us. But as we kind of start rounding this out, uh, you know, oh, Nick, Brian, go ahead and uh, kind of say your goodbyes, if you will. Sure. Thanks, Kenny. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, again, I'm Nick from Breaking Bourbon. Uh, breakingbourbon.com. Uh, check us out on social media at Breaking Bourbon. And uh, thanks, guys. This was fun. Uh, always enjoy uh, chatting on a, a Monday night and drinking bourbon. So <laughs> can't get much better. <laughs> nope. <laughs> All right, Brian, you're up. Yeah. Thanks for having me again. This is uh, Brian with Sip and Corn. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, and, and Facebook, all Sip and Corn, and online at bourbonjustice.com or sipandcorn.com. And let's uh, let's make sure we're thinking of Blake, too. He dropped off pretty quick there. Um, and uh, think of everybody in Florida that's got this hurricane bearing down on him. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is also going to be the last roundtable before we all see each other at Bourbon Beyond. I know we're all really super psyched about it. Uh, we can't wait to meet a lot of you that are going to be there. So make sure that if you are there, don't feel uh, scared or anything. Come up, say hi to us. You know, we love talking to to everybody. Uh, so, Fred, I'll let you kind of go ahead and close it out for us. Yeah, one one quick thing. I uh, a cor- Correction to something I said. I had said that Pernod had uh, Barton. It's not true. Constellation had Barton, and they sold it in 2009. Constellation also coming back into the bourbon business. But – Welcome. Thank you guys so much for, for, for hanging out with us this evening. I love this show. The roundtables is, is my favorite thing that we do uh, with Bourbon Pursuit. 
And if you're not following Bourbon Pursuit on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, you got to do it. It's just at Bourbon Pursuit. There you'll see uh, basically Kenny's bar collection for like 24 days in a row and then a random watch this tonight. It's the round table. Yep, absolutely. So make sure you, uh, you know, he gave us the shout out. Make sure you're following all these guys on social media. You can find their handles in our show notes as well. Uh, with that, cheers, fellas. Thanks again. And we'll see everybody at Bourbon and Beyond. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, cheers everyone. Cheers.